Hello, today we're going to be reacting to the second debate between um, um, wannabe Governor Glenn Youngkin, who's the Republican, and the Democrat, uh, Terry McAuliffe, who was governor about 10 years ago, actually. Uh, so, yes, this is going to be hosted by Chuck Todd. Uh, very low energy, but anyways, uh, this is an election which is almost definitely going to go to the Democrats, according to me, but a lot of people are very optimistic about it. So, um, if we're going to flip an election, let's make this one the one that does happen. Uh, the last time a Republican won the governorship of Virginia was in 2009, actually, uh, with Bob McConnell, I believe. And that was a wave year for Republicans. Um, this will be a wave year for Republicans as well, just that um, the difference being that uh, Virginia went less than 10 points for Barack Obama in 2008, whereas in 2020, uh, Virginia went over 10 points for Biden. Now, you can say there were shenanigans, but overall, still, Trump lost it by more than seven. Either way, you slice it in all likelihood. Okay, so let's let them... Get well, the no, bullshit out of the way. Uh, it, there was. Come on. <laughs> no, once. Mr. Mel, you can see your light. Okay, come on. Safely for this exchange of ideas. So let's begin by today's event. The debate will last one hour, and it will begin with 90 second opening statements from each candidate. Then our panelists and myself will pose questions directly to the candidates. These questions are determined by NBC News and the panelists, period. They have not been reviewed by the candidates or the Northern Virginia Chamber. Each candidate will have one minute to respond, and the candidate answering first will get an additional 30 second rebuttal. And as moderator, I will reserve the right to follow up as needed. And finally, we will conclude the debate with one minute closing statements from each candidate. There is a timekeeper who will notify candidates of their remaining time, and when time has expired, in the interest of trying to be covering Virginia politics, Republican Glenn Youngkin. Yeah, we know you're enjoying both. And with that, let's begin, Mr. Youngkin, your 90 second opening statement. Great, thank you. My fellow Virginians, tonight I ask you to join me. I ask you to hire me to go work for you. I'm a husband, I'm a father, I'm a man of faith, I'm a job creator, and I'm a homegrown Virginian. Over the last eight years, Virginia has seen itself fall behind, seriously behind. Schools failing, murder rate rising, cost of living skyrocketing, and our economy and job machines stalling. We can fix this. On day one, I will cut taxes. I'll eliminate the grocery tax, saving Virginians all in $1,500 in year one. We will reestablish excellence in schools, investing in teachers and facilities and charter schools. We'll fully fund police. We'll reinvigorate the job machine, creating 400,000 jobs. Now, my opponent tonight will say untruths about me, my plan, his record, and his extreme views. That's what 40-year politicians do. In our last debate, he lied to you, the voters, once about every other minute, trying to hide his views on getting rid of right to work, on defunding police, on selling out to the teachers' unions. His so-called plans will cost Virginians $16 billion, $5,400 each in a tax increase. It's recycled failed policies. My fellow Virginians, tonight I'll share my vision for lower taxes, for the best jobs, for the best schools, for the safest thank, communities. Thank you, and I ask you for your vote tonight. Mr. Collier, you're nice. Okay, that was pretty good. He really made it a broad appeal that was Republican-oriented, and that was pretty flawless. Not bad. Thank you. I am so excited to be with everybody tonight. I was honored to be your 72nd governor. And if you remember when I took office, I inherited an economy that was in chaos. I got to work. I got out of bed every single day fighting for you. I worked in a bipartisan manner, and guess what? We created 120,000 new jobs. Personal income went up 14%. But now we have COVID, so we've got new challenges. So I've got 20 very serious plans of how I will lead us out of this COVID pandemic. I talk about raising the minimum wage, paid sick days. Talk about healthcare, bringing those costs down, and making sure we drop the costs on prescription drugs. I did a billion dollar investment in education last time I was governor. I'm gonna do two billion now to make sure our children are getting the skills they need in order to be successful. But none of this works if we don't defeat COVID. And I'm running against a candidate who actually has been spreading anti vax rhetoric throughout the Commonwealth of Virginia. We cannot move this economy forward and keep our schools open if we're not getting our folks vaccinated. He doesn't believe nurses and doctors and teachers should be vaccinated. I do. He goes on right wing radio and says, quote, you don't want it, don't take it. He was also recently quoted saying, you know, there's many good reasons why you don't need to get vaccinated. He told college students, if you don't want to get it, just fill an exemption for whatever the reason. And he just said that nurses working in cancer facilities on individuals who are getting chemotherapy don't need to be vaccinated. I will defeat COVID as your governor. It'll be my top priority, and we will build a right. strong economy. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you. Look, we're going to begin with the COVID pandemic. Uh, obviously, it's infected 840,000 Virginians. It's killed more than 12,000 in the state. Uh, this is the clear difference right now between the two of you uh, is on the issue of vaccine mandates, as, as it's just been brought up. Mr. Young opposing them, Mr. McCullough supporting them for all workers who live in the state. So, Mr. Young, can you get the first question? You personally favor being vaccinated, but believe it should be a choice. But why should state teachers, healthcare workers, and other essential employees be allowed to do their jobs unvaccinated? Well, just to reiterate, uh, I actually believe that everyone should get the vaccine, despite the fact it's the most egregious untruth that my opponent continues to say about me. I've gotten the vaccine. My family's gotten the vaccine. It's the best way for people to keep themselves safe. And I, in fact, have asked everyone in Virginia to please get the vaccine. But I don't think we should mandate it. And I think we find ourselves at a moment where my opponent has said, he's looked at the television screen, and he has said, if you don't get the vaccine, it'll make your life difficult. He wants employers to fire employees who don't get the vaccine. At a time when we are trying to come out of this pandemic, we're ranked 44th in the nation in job recovery. We need those healthcare workers. We need people on the job. To make their life difficult, that's no way to go serve Virginians. We can do this. We can, in fact, protect lives and livelihoods. And as governor, that's what I'll do in Virginia. Uh, Mr. McCullough, you're one minute. Let's be clear. Glenn Youngkin is the one who's been lying to you. He goes on right wing radio and does his right wing rallies and tells his supporters, his quote, if you don't want to get it, don't get it. You can't be governor saying things like that. That is disqualifying. We had 8,000 cases yesterday in Virginia. 10% of Virginia's population has been infected. We need leadership as governor, not trying to be a Trump wannabe and doing the talking points, but he says one thing on right-wing radio and then come here, comes here and says something different. He has said, day one is he's governor, mass off and no vaccination requirements. Think about that. So you've got a parent who's got a child, a sixth, seventh grader, going to be going to school first grade. They can't get it because they're too young. And he's going to send a child to a school where the teacher's not wearing a mask and the teacher's not right. vaccinated. Thank that you. is disqualifying Thank the governor. Thank you, Mr. McCullough. 30 seconds. Mr. I think what is most the accusatory whiny cadence to his voice is not appealing to anybody, and if he's the former governor, he ought to be in a position to um, assert authority and make people think like, oh, God, we need this guy back, and none of this 
this guy is going to send your seventh grader unvaccinated. Shut the fuck up, you pussy. Come on. Most uh, hypocritical here is no more than five or six weeks ago, Barry McAuliffe actually shared my view that companies should not mandate. It should be a decision that companies should make. And then for political expediency, he must have seen a poll somewhere. He changed his view completely. This is what you get from Terry McAuliffe. It's whatever he thinks he needs to say to get your vote. Let me be clear. I believe the vaccine absolutely saves lives. I think the last 20 months has been an absolute tragedy. And I look forward to working with Virginians to get people vaccinated I mean, to help people live their lives. A quick follow-up to you, Mr. Do you believe getting vaccinated for measles, mumps, or rubella is a personal choice for Virginians? I think, I think that the, 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 that the uh, uh, data associated with those vaccines is something that we should absolutely understand the difference between this vaccine. And we have a moment here. We have a moment here to help people understand the real information in this vaccine. So you would keep those so, vaccines mandatory? So that we could, so that those we, vaccines mandatory, not COVID? Those vaccines, those right. vaccines should, can be mandatory. I do believe the COVID vaccine is one that everyone should get, but we shouldn't mandate it. All right, I want to move to the next question. Mr. McCullough, this one goes to you first. Uh, your opponent's ads have said you're too dangerous for Virginia. Pointing to the fact that during your Okay, that's interesting. So he basically um, uses the rhetoric of, okay, so, <laughs> this is really funny because they're already screwing him. It's been less than 10 minutes and already we have a triangulation against Youngkin and even the phrasing of the question from Chuck Todd is very unfair. I see this because he necessarily says, okay, well, you support these old vaccines that have been around for 50 years. Why don't you support mandating the COVID vaccine? The obvious response would be, well, obviously the COVID thing is less than a year old and I don't want to force that on people, whereas the measles and the polio vaccine has been around since like the Second World War era. So it's ridiculous to assert what you just said as being comparable at all. But of course, he can't say that because that's too based for Virginia. So he says, oh, well, I believe in the vaccine. So meh. First term is governor murders per year, 20%, and rapes rose by nearly 30%. What responsibility do you bear for this increase in crime, and what would you do to reduce the rise we're seeing right now today? First of all, as governor, your job is to keep your community safe. As governor, I invested in our state police, our law enforcement, and our sheriffs. I got 1,000 sheriffs off of food stamps when I was governor. And guess what? Virginia had the lowest crime rate of any major state in the United States of America. I'm proud. I'm the first governor to ever become an honorary sheriff from the Sheriff's Association. But if you want to talk about keeping people safe, we got to keep guns off the street. And Glenn and I differ. He has said publicly that there is not one single gun protection bill that he supports. And then he said, let me be clear, none. We've passed background checks and I support it. After the tragedies of Virginia Beach and Virginia Tech, we need to get guns off the streets. Today in Virginia, if a spouse goes on social media and says, I am going to kill my spouse, we can go in and take that gun away. Glenn Youngkin will roll back all common sense gun protections. So he'll not have background checks. And guess what? Criminals will get guns, they'll kill civilians, and Thank they'll kill law enforcement. He you. is too dangerous to be governor of the country. Thank you, Mr. Youngkin. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get this in a minute. Which I agree. All right. Thank you. All right. All right. All right. Security. All right. We're going to take a quick commercial break. We'll be right back. Black women are crazy. What the fuck was that? Neither candidates responded in a way that was noteworthy. That's interesting. Chuck Todd completely baited a bitch. I would have said, you fat black bitch, shut the fuck up. Get this fucking Goliath the fuck out of here, bro. What's going on? And now we know why we should stick a couple of them. Well, we are back live here in Alexandria with the two candidates uh, for governor of Virginia there on this stage. Now it's your one minute and there'll be a 30 second Because the murder rate went up 43% when he was governor and the rate rate went up every year. Law enforcement has universally supported me. 50 sheriffs have supported me. Four sheriffs have joined the Republican Party. The Fraternal Order of Police endorsed me yesterday. The Police Benevolent Association has endorsed me. Law enforcement community wholeheartedly trusts that I will do the right thing. We'll invest in law enforcement. We'll protect qualified immunity. We'll invest in a broken mental health system. We'll make our community safe again. What Mr. McAuliffe actually endorses is in fact a, a parole board that sacrifices the rights of victims in, in turn to protect criminals. I all believe in second chances, but we have to protect Virginians. And on day one, we're also going to replace the entire parole board. Mr. McCullough, 30 seconds. Thank you. As I mentioned earlier, let the facts determine here. We had the lowest crime rate of any major state in America when I was governor. Not the second lowest, not the third lowest, not the fourth lowest. The absolute lowest. That took a lot of work, and I leaned in. And I'm very proud as governor. I worked in a bipartisan way to get the toughest domestic violence law in the United States of America. The Washington Post has endorsed me, glowingly. And the Washington Post said that Glenn Youngkin's economic plan will defund the police here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Go read right. the editorial. Mr. McCullough, a quick follow for you. Uh, you said, your campaign previously said you favored ending protecting police officers from civil lawsuits, so-called qualified immunity. Yeah. But then you said you wouldn't end it. Explain why you changed your mind. First of all, it's called qualified immunity for a reason. I have always said that if any law officer is out acting in good faith, doing their job, they will have the full protection of the Commonwealth of Virginia. But if there is a law enforcement officer who breaks the law, they get zero protection. That's why we call it qualified immunity. So I've always been 100% for protecting any law enforcement officer every day who's out there, and I'm very proud of the men and women I have the Fairfax okay. Sheriff Stacey 
Jason Cade, who's here, is a big supporter of mine. I right. thank her for being here. But but if you break the law, Chuck, you're not going to get qualified immunity. We will not protect it. So you don't want to change. You're not changing the law on qualified immunity. No. Okay. Now you should know that the General Assembly, okay. you know, has a task force going. They're looking that. at all this, and I'll see what comes to my desk. Julie Carey has the next question. Mr. Youngkin, in the first debate on the subject of abortion restriction, you said, "quote I do believe a pain threshold bill would be appropriate." Unquote. Now in Congress, a pain threshold bill would make performing abortions after 20 weeks of gestation a crime. That's in a woman's second trimester of her pregnancy. If you become governor, would you work to outlaw abortions beginning in the second trimester? Yeah, so thank you very much for that question. And, and let me start because uh, my opponent has mischaracterized my uh, my position here repeatedly. First, I am pro-life. I do believe in exceptions in the case where there's rape or incest or the mother's life is in jeopardy. I also believe that a pain threshold bill is one like the one in Congress that we could and should support. My opponent, on the other hand, is the most extreme abortion candidate in the country. What I know I will do is block legislation like he said he would sign, where a child is kept comfortable after the child is born when a decision is made whether that child lives or dies. He called that legislation common sense legislation and said he would sign it. The vast, vast majority of Virginians disagree with Terry McAuliffe on his abortion stance. He actually said he's going to promote Virginia businesses to come, for companies to come to Virginia because it's the easiest place to get an abortion. I think that's shameful. Mr. McAuliffe, one minute. Uh, I'd like to see you release a tape with someone actually saying that. Uh, there's not a thing that Glenn Youngkin just said is true. And what he's done is he got caught on tape secretly saying that when he is governor, he will go on the offense to ban abortions and defund Planned Parenthood. And he says, I won't go squishy on you. That's what he said. But I want every woman in Virginia to listen to me closely. I was a brick wall to protect women's rights when I was governor. They tried to shut the 16 women's clinics down. And had I not got elected in 2013, there would not be a women's clinic open today. I support the laws that are on the books today, which 80% of Virginians support and a majority of Republicans support. That's what I support as governor. Glenn Youngkin is in the extreme. And I can tell you this. Businesses are not going to come to a state where they're putting walls up around their state. He's against gay marriage. He's against abortion. And that's his religious right. And I respect his right for his opinion. Let's go! I cannot. The businesses that I brought to Virginia, Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, okay. they are not coming thank to you. a state that discriminates against women. Thank you. They're not. Mr. McCall, 30 seconds. Yeah, thank you. Again, Terry. See, that, he, he doesn't know what he's saying there, but it, it, it is very profound. He's saying, you know, these big corporations, Amazon, Google, et cetera, will not bring their um, upper middle class jobs to Virginia if um, we let in a conservative. Uh, and that's awfully, that's a mask off moment. And in terms of the actual thing that, you know, that he mentioned about Glenn Youngkin being like too far right or something and warding off companies, I really don't think that's something that would ward off any company. Um, the type of governor that a state has almost definitely doesn't play into what company comes into a state usually, especially if you're talking about such a milk toast Republican such as Glenn Youngkin. And in terms of what he's going to say, he better say something along the lines of, you know, what, what Trump would say about the big corporations. I'm curious what he'll say. I just can't understand how you can just so comfortably lie to everybody. And let's just be clear. That's what you've been doing. You, you, stood up, you stood up in front of a group of people and said that you would bring companies here because it was easier to get an abortion. You want to be the abortion governor. Let's be clear. Companies are not making these choices. Ford Motor Company decided to put four plants, $7 billion, two in Kentucky, one in Tennessee, and one in Georgia. They skipped Virginia. This is the legacy you've left Virginia. A dying economy, okay. jobs that aren't for anyone, and you absolutely misunderstand what it takes to get companies to come right. so that Virginia's going to have very, the kind of future they very, deserve. Very quick, I got two follow-ups for you on this issue. Mr. Youngkin, first to you. Do you support a right to an abortion being included in Virginia's constitution? No, I do not. Okay. Uh, and Mr. McCullough. Uh, you believe a woman should make her own decision on reproductive rights. In the last debate, you said you support that right only through a second trimester. So just to nail this down, what restrictions do you support when it comes to access to abortion? I support the laws today that, Chuck, we have on the books here in the Commonwealth of Virginia, which is, I say, 80% of Virginians do. I would like to see Roe v. Wade enshrined in our Constitution because I'm scared of Donald Trump and the people like Glenn Youngkin. Uh, women are tired okay. of people like Glenn Youngkin I, telling I them what to do with their bodies. Right. It is time that I, men leave women alone and let them make their own choice about their Alberto, own reproductive rights. Alberto, Alberto, you get the next question. Uh, Mr. McCauley, uh, current Virginia Governor Rapp Northern recently touted a record $2.6 billion budget surplus. A portion of that money is dedicated to the General Resource Fund, better known as Rainy Day Fund. Correct. You know that, right? Uh, your opponent calls that surplus clear evidence of overtaxation, and he's proposed returning $1.5 billion to taxpayers. Why should Virginians who've just gone through such challenging times during the pandemic reap some of this fiscal reward in the form of a tax relief? First of all, that $2.6 billion came from a $14.3 billion one-time American Rescue Plan money. So as I say, when I took office, I had to call a special session to eliminate a $2.5 billion deficit that had been left for me, and I left a half a billion dollar surplus. I'll put more money in people's pockets. But Glenn always comes up with these crazy tax schemes. The Washington Post, the Roanoke paper, three independent studies have said that what he will do will destroy Virginia's economy. It'll take $10 billion out of education. You'll see 43,000 teachers cut, including 3,000 right here in Fairfax County. I mean, he loves his tax schemes. I mean, he even went to Fairfax County last year during COVID and had a faulty tax scheme because he keeps horses in his backyard, fancy horses, and actually got an agriculture exemption and basically chiseled Fairfax County out of $75,000 a year, which is actually a year's salary for a teacher. I'm not going to do that. You make hundreds of millions of dollars, and why are you chiseling Fairfax County okay. so that you can have an agriculture Thank exemption for your fancy horses in your backyard? I just think what? that's wrong. One that to you, Mr. Thank you. So let's begin that the $2.6 billion surplus was actually generated by overtaxing Virginians. $4.3 billion went to, the federal, went to the state government from the federal government. Over $9 went other places. Here, I know you don't understand revenues and expenses. You have no idea what you're talking about here. Revenues and expenses, I know are hard for you. I know they are. I know they're hard for you. So I know they're hard for you. That's why you got twice your But at the end of the day, you have no idea what you're talking about. So what I what I believe is that money belongs to Virginians, not Terry McAuliffe. And oh, by the way, they're going to overtax us again by $2.6 billion again. They're piling on tax upon tax. So we're going to eliminate the grocery tax. We're going to double the standard deduction. We're going to declare the largest tax rebate in Virginia history. We're going to cut the taxation on our military retirement up to $40,000. So they'll stay here. We, in fact, find Virginia losing out with families moving away to the other states faster than they're moving here because our taxes are too high, and we're going to bring them down and make our cost of living in Virginia lower. Go ahead, 30 seconds. Yeah, 30 seconds. Yeah. Glenn Youngkin will have no Terry's way. trying to make Glenn seem crazy so that Glenn loses the moderate support that he has right now, and he's not breaking, and that's a good thing. He needs to keep the composure, and Terry's just looking increasingly desperate. 
to the point where he's at risk of losing the election over looking like a little bitch. Only to bring jobs here because he wants to ban abortion. He's against gay marriage. I got co-star to move to, to Richmond, Virginia. A thousand jobs are doing another thousand jobs because we are an open, welcoming state. I can tell you, there's extreme positions. Businesses won't come here. I got Nestle Corporation to move out of LA. Eleven hundred new economic development projects. Twenty billion new capital when I was governor. That's a successor. And I left a half a billion dollar surplus when I was in office. I inherited a two and a half billion dollar deficit. That's just a fact. And we created. Guess what? All right. Two hundred thousand new jobs and personal income okay. up fourteen percent. I am very proud of that record. All right. Let me move to our next issue here. I got the next question for you, Mr. Youngkin. Thank you. Let me turn to the issue of election integrity. Out of more than four million ballots cast in Virginia's 2020 presidential election, there was just one reported case of voter fraud, and that person was convicted this year of misdemeanor. So, Mr. Youngkin, earlier this year, you said election integrity is a top priority of yours. But at the last debate, you acknowledged that there had not been significant fraud in Virginia's election. So, if it's not a problem, why call it a priority? Well, election integrity, making sure our elections are trusted and safe, is not a Republican issue. It's not a Democrat issue. But of course, my opponent stood up and said in 2000 that they stole the election from us, and he said it continually, and he never acknowledged that George W. Bush was legitimately elected. We, in fact, saw after that Florida invest in their election, their election process and actually report first. Virginians deserve that. So we're going to invest in our election process so the Virginians trust it. I said there wasn't, there wasn't material fraud, and I believe that the election was certifiably fair. But I want to get back to one thing a minute ago. My opponent mischaracterizes his record so, so acutely. Virginia, over the last eight years, has grown economically 70% faster than the 70% slower than the states around us. Maryland, North Carolina, Tennessee, South Carolina, Georgia, they have outpaced us by 70% when you were governor, 120%, creating more jobs and more opportunity. That's the legacy you've left Virginia. Mr. McCall, if you want to. Election integrity. This is all Glenn Youngkin had on his website for seven months. This is all he talked about. He's actually said it is the most important issue facing Virginians. <laughs> election integrity, really? I think it's jobs, I think it's COVID, I think it's healthcare, I think it's education. You know why? Because he's a, he, he's a total wannabe Donald Trump. This is all goes back to the 2020 election that somehow Trump mysteriously, they put their tinfoil hats on, and all of a sudden Trump really won the 2020 election. But you know, it runs down our democracy, and we shouldn't allow this to happen. But he said so much of the reason he's running for governor, his quote, is because of Donald Trump. He's been endorsed by Donald Trump four times. He said he's honored and pleased to have Donald Trump's endorsement. So, you know, he plays this game that he goes through his extreme people, he does on right wing radio and talks about these issues, and then tries to come here in Northern Virginia and pretend, oh, I'm some moderate. He's not. He's extreme on abortion, election integrity, and all these other issues. He right. is bought and paid for by Donald Trump. He wants thank, to bring Donald Trump's style politics to Virginia, and we're thank not going to allow it. Mr. Yankin, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, Terry, you just made folks in Las Vegas a lot of money. Whoa, what the fuck just happened? Did you just see there? Um, just slandering Glenn Youngkin, this little sniveling fucking prick. Terry McAuliffe, you little rat. You know, just saying, oh, you did you, 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 Trump lost, bro. Shut the fuck up. You know better. Glenn knows better. We all know what happened last year. And it's hilarious. So it's like, oh, we put on the chin fall hat and Trump won. Shut the fuck up, you condescending prick. Seriously. This guy is so unlikable. I know you love to go campaign there versus being here, but there's an over and under tonight. There's an over and under tonight on how many times you're going to say Donald Trump. And it was 10, and you just busted through it. You're running against Glenn Young. You're, you're running against Glenn Young. I know you wish you weren't because the polls say I'm ahead. If you're running against me, let's have Terry McCullough versus Glenn Young, and let's decide. Let's let Virginia voters decide who they want their next governor to be. It, it, the, right. reason, the reason Chuck is. Yeah, let's be clear. The reason is he has said he keeps invoking Trump. He's endorsed four times. The only person invoking Trump is you. All right, go ahead, Julie. You got the next question. You both want to hear this, Mr. McCullough. Your campaign website promises you will implement the Virginia Department of Education's new model policy to protect protect transgender students. Now that's a policy that allows students to use the restroom and locker room that matches their gender identity and requires school employees to address students by their chosen pronoun. But in the last debate, you said it should be up to local school districts to be able to create their own policies. So which should it be, statewide protection or local choice? I like locals having input, obviously, on such an important issue, but the state will always issue guidance as we do from the Department of Education. But I've said this before. These children are going through very stressful situations. Why people continually want to demonize children, I just don't understand. I want every child in Virginia to get a quality education. I put a record billion dollars in education the last time I was governor. No matter the color of your skin or whom you love, I believe you should get a great quality education. And that's why I've called for a $2 billion year investment. We've got to raise teacher pay above the national average. I want every single student to get access to broadband. I want to make sure that those at risk three and four year olds, about 41,000, actually get a pre K education. I've got a real education plan. Washington Post and other papers have ridiculed Glenn Youngkin's economic plan. And they have said, just read it, that it will cost education $10 billion. You here in Fairfax County will lose 3,000 teachers. I want more teachers, not fewer. Mr. Youngkin, one minute. Thank you. Let me begin. The economic plan that Terry keeps referring to has nothing to do with my economic plan. He doesn't like mine because it's better than his. And he picked up another one and is using that for all of these baseless comments. And with regard to our kids in schools, we are called to love everyone. To love everyone. And I agree with your conclusion, Terry, that we should let local school districts actually make these decisions. But we must ask them to include concepts of safety and privacy and respect in the discussion. And we must demand that they include parents in this dialogue. What we've seen over the course of the last 20 months is our school systems refusing to engage with parents. In fact, in Fairfax County this past week, we watched parents so upset because there was such explicit, sexually explicit material in the library they had never seen. It was shocking. And in fact, you vetoed the bill that would have informed parents that they were there. You believe school systems should tell children what to do. I believe parents should be in charge of okay. their kids' education. Just about 30 seconds. <laughs> So first of all, this shows how clueless Glenn Youngkin is. He doesn't understand what the laws were because he's never been involved here in helping Virginia. But it was not. The parents had to write the veto bill, veto books, Glenn, not to be knowledgeable about it, also take them off the shelves. And I'm not going to let parents go into schools and actually take books out and make their own decisions. So, yeah, I stop the bill that I don't think parents should be telling schools what they should teach. But, you know, I get really tired of everybody running down teachers. I love our teachers. And what they have done through COVID, these are real heroes that deserve our respect. And you keep running Thank it down. You. Thank you, Mr. Paul. Simp faggot. Mr. Youngkin, uh, Virginia has extended protections to ensure that Virginia uh, renters are not evicted until June 2022 due to the pandemic. What is your position on evictions? Yeah, I think that there's a really good legal framework in place to provide resources and support for people so that they won't be kicked out of their homes. I mean, we've been through a really, really tough pandemic. In fact, I think it's worse in Virginia than it otherwise needed to be. We rank 44th in the nation in job recovery because we have a stalled economy going in, and we actually rank 50th
I'm gonna go to work on day one. We're gonna not shut down our economy, no lockdowns. We're gonna cut job killing regulations. We're gonna turn on our job machine, create 400,000 jobs, and I'm gonna protect the right to work. And Terry McAuliffe can get rid of it, and it's gonna be the death blow for Virginia. Mr. McAuliffe, one minute. Uh, first of all, if you read my plan, I have a whole housing plan. We need to put more money in the Virginia Housing Trust Fund. We've got to work with the federal government, get more waivers here for us so that we can keep people in their homes. That will be a top priority. Working in public private, I just met with the leadership of Amazon the other day, just put hundreds of millions of dollars into affordable housing. So we need to do, especially up here in Northern Virginia, we need a lot more affordable housing. I have a whole plan of how we'll do it. Glenn keeps running down our economy. Well, while he was working creating jobs, let me tell you about Glenn's experience here. He took 300 jobs out of Virginia when he was the CEO. He closed the Arlington office, moved him to another state. When he was the chief operating officer, he was running a company called Small Smiles, which actually was cited a huge fine from the Inspector General because what they were doing was unnecessary medical procedures on children. 100 cases in Manassas, babies were forced to have root canals, many of them without proper anesthesia. And why? He did it for profit. I was here working here in Virginia to create good paying jobs. Well, he was making billions of dollars in the Carlisle Group and hurting seniors with manor care and hurting children here with his small style uh, dental clinic. We're not gonna have that here. 30 seconds, Creating jobs is a lot more than flying around all times places and holding press releases. I mean, Terry McAuliffe used $1.4 million of taxpayer money to pay to a Chinese website that turned out to be a sham. And all you did was have a press conference and fly to China to celebrate it. You lost $1.4 million of taxpayer money and no job showed up. I'm proud of Carlisle. One of the things I'm proud about Carlisle mostly is that when things didn't quite go right, when things were not where we planned, we worked hard to put them right. Okay. We had tens of thousands of employees that worked for companies and we wanted to serve I got, them. I got quick, That's what we yeah, do. I got a quick 30 seconds. Yeah. I'm give each of you on this one question. You both live in wealthy neighborhoods. You both live in a wealthy neighborhood. How do you convince wealthy homeowners that affordable housing should be built in their neighborhood too? And they don't fight it because they're worried about property values. 30 seconds to you, Mr. McCullough, 30 seconds to you then. So I think everybody here in North Virginia understands the desperate need. People who work here shouldn't have to drive two hours uh, to be able to work every single day. So what you do is you work with the local, the cities, and the counties. And if you read my plan, I have a whole program together on regulations and zoning to make it easier for people to build affordable housing. And we'll invest money at the state level through the Virginia Housing Trust Authority so that we will invest with them, incentivize developers to build low-income housing. It is one of the biggest issues that we yeah. face here. And, it's, and the reason is so many jobs. I recruited 1,100 yeah. companies to come to the Commonwealth of Virginia. Mr. I wrote the bid for Amazon. Do you think your neighbors would, you would support seeing duplexes built? I, I, think every, I think every part of Northern Virginia has got different zoning requirements. And that is up to the local authorities. I think the biggest challenge we have in affordable housing is the mound of that have been piled on top of businesses for the last eight years that all of a sudden have every house built in Virginia required 20 to 25 percent of the housing cost to, to actually get through permitting and regulations. We actually make it easier to permit and we can bring down the cost of housing. We need more supply. Okay. The bottom line is the bottom line is that when this economy starts really Thank growing you. when I'm governor, yep. as opposed to the stall growth when Terry McAuliffe is governor, Thank we're going to have a bigger problem. We're going to have to work to create affordable Albert, housing for Virginians. Albert, you get the next question, please. Uh, the removal of Confederate General Robert E. Lee statue reminds us. Uh, uh, the removal of Confederate General Robert E. Lee statue reminds us how deeply racist woven into Virginia's history and that Virginia has sometimes been on the wrong side of that history, whether it's slavery, yeah. the Civil War, the state's former interracial marriage ban, or segregated schools. How should Virginia school children be taught about these issues? Yeah, and I was happy those statues came down. They were symbols of hate and divisiveness. And I also leaned in when I was governor. I banned the Confederate flag from the Virginia license plates. I think it's important that we send a message that our state is open and welcoming. But we need to teach our children the full history of who we are as a commonwealth and who we are as a country. I think it's very important. But those statues needed to come down. As you all know, I was a leader on voting rights. I enfranchised more voters than any governor in the history of the United States of America. That was the right thing to do. I was all about lifting people up, giving people second opportunities. And you know what? That's why I want to lean in and help folks next time. I want to see that we raise the minimum wage. I think it's disgraceful that some home health care worker goes in penthouses a day, cleaning bedpans all day, and she makes $7.25 and she has no benefits. It's time to pay people $15 an hour here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Treat people with dignity and respect. Mr. Yuck, one minute. Thank you. Um, what's interesting is how quickly Terry McAuliffe moved off of his statement when he was governor that the Robert E. Lee statue and the Stonewall Jackson statue should be left alone. Teaching our children about racism in our school is a real challenge. I think we recognize that Virginia and America has chapters that are abhorrent. We also have great chapters. We need to teach our children real history. We need to teach our children to come together and have dreams that they can aspire and go get. We don't need to teach our children to view everything through a lens of race and then pit them against one another so that their dreams are in fact stolen from them. On day one, we're going to get education moving. We're going to reestablish expectations of excellence. My opponent watered down standards in schools to the point where our children are falling so far behind the Commonwealth of Virginia. 62% of Virginia kids cannot pass an eighth grade math equivalency test because of the legacy that Terry McAuliffe left us. We're going to go to work and fix that on day one. Mr. Once again, Glenn knows nothing about Virginia. Uh, I remind him of the bill that we passed on education reform. I had a Republican legislature. Guess what it passed in the Virginia Senate, which was Republican? 40 to zero. It got 85 votes out of 100 in the House of Delegates. You're attacking your own Republican Party, Glenn. It's just, you know, you get your talking points. You understand the law of Virginia right. and how these things all work. And it, it's just not right. So I will invest in education. I will build up education. And that's what we need to do. And I'm excited about it. But his plan will cost okay. 43,000 teachers. Don't thank take you. my word for it. Read the Washington Post. Read the three thank, independent. Thank, thank you, Mr. McCall. Julie, thank you. No, that was my story. Next question, Julie. Mr. Yelkin, as you know, thousands of Afghan evacuees are now here in Virginia at Fort Lee, Fort Pickett, and Marine Bates Quantico after being evacuated from Afghanistan shortly after the Taliban took control of that nation. Do you support Virginia helping these evacuees resettle here and stay in the Commonwealth? And how should the state do that if so? Yes, let's just start with what we saw happen in Afghanistan. We saw an abject failure of leadership from Joe Biden. He abandoned our military, he abandoned American citizens, he abandoned our allies, and he abandoned Afghans who had gone shoulder to shoulder with us, trying to make a way forward. I think that we, in fact, have to recognize what failure of leadership looks like, and in fact, that Terry McAuliffe describes all of this. We've watched failure in our border down in, down in Texas. It's absolute chaos, open borders. And we recognize that we're a nation of laws, and we need to make sure that we're processing everyone who comes in. Have they had a COVID vaccine? Here, you want everybody else to get one? Have Afghan refugees got one? Yeah, I do. I, I, do I, think, I, think, I think we should, in fact, Make sure that those that stood shoulder to shoulder with us are welcomed, that they're processed appropriately, and that they can have a home in Virginia. Go ahead, Mr. McCullough. Sure, absolutely. These people helped the United States
We were the first state in America to functionally end veteran homelessness. We were the first state in America to add all these college courses to make sure we could get our veterans jobs as soon as they came out of active duty. First state in America to have our cyber vets. And when I was governor, 26,000 more vets were hired to our V3 program. I love our military, and I'm proud of our military here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. Mr. Governor, 30 seconds. Today we see more of our veterans moving away from Virginia than moving to Virginia. This year, it's estimated that 25,000 of our heroes will complete their last posting in Virginia and move away. And they're going to Tennessee and North Carolina, South Carolina, Georgia, Florida, Texas, and Arizona because Virginia is not the right place for them because they can't find a job. We tax their retirement benefits. We've made it hard for them to transition from military service to civilian life. I'm going to go fix all of that when I'm governor. We're going to turn Virginia into the most military-friendly state in America. All right, thank you. Uh, Mr. McCall, you get the next question here. When you first ran for governor in 2013, you opposed changing the state's right to work law. During your most recent primary race this year, you reversed course and you now support it. Why'd you change your mind? So first of all, right to work's not going to change here in Virginia. They finally got a bill up in the House of Delegates last year, and it was defeated 85 to 12. Can't even get a hearing in the Senate. So I'm going to focus my energies on things that we can do. I want to raise the minimum wage. I want paid sick leave. I want family medical leave. As governor, I always focus on things that we can get done. And that's what I'll do as your governor. And that's why I built, contrary to what you're hearing from Glenn, a robust economy. I inherited an economy from a Republican governor that had a gigantic deficit. And I left a huge surplus when I left office. And that's the reason why so many Republicans have endorsed me. Over two dozen prominent Republicans. Tonight, I have a leading conservative in America here, Bill Crystal, who has endorsed my campaign for governor. I have Delegate Dave Ramadan, one of the most conservative members of the House of Delegates. He's endorsed my campaign. Former senators, former delegates. Why? They know I'll work in a bipartisan way to move Virginia forward. That's why I'm back running for governor, to take Virginia to that next level. I want to see us lead America out of this COVID crisis. Mr. Yacht, one minute. Thank you. So let's be clear. The leadership in our Democrat Party today is trying to get rid of right to work. Luke Torian, who is the chair of the Appropriations Committee, said it was a top five issue to get rid of. The Senate Majority Leader introduced the bill last time to get rid of right to work. This bill is going to come to his desk, and Terry McAuliffe will sign it. He said that, and the minute he said he would sign it, every union in America endorsed him. He's collected tens of millions of dollars from them. It'll be the death blow for Virginia business climate. This is why every business organization in Virginia that has offered an endorsement so far has given it to me. Not to you, Terry, but to me. They don't trust you. This is about standing up for what's right for Virginia workers, not forcing them to join a union because you can, get, you can get donations from them. We, in fact, have to recognize that Virginia's economy must grow, not be stalled. And we can go to work together to build an economy that will lift up all Virginians. And that's what I'm going to do as your governor. 30 seconds. First of all, I have tremendous business support. In fact, I think of the Char School who we're at, Dwight Char, National Finance Chair, Republican National Committee, George Bush's Finance Chair. One of our biggest business leaders founded NBR Homes. Who's he supporting? He's supporting me. And that. why do so? You may talk to him. Great. What good is that do you? He's supporting. He's already endorsed me. He's already on my public list. Yeah, a lot of unions support me. You know why? I am for raising the minimum wage. He is against raising the minimum wage. He's against paid sick days. He's against family medical leave. You vote for Terry McCall, you are going Mr. to get those done, and we are going to lift up workers here in Virginia and make them the best workforce Mr. McCall, in the United States. Follow you. If Mr. McCall, if, North, if, if the Amazon workers in Northern Virginia want to unionize, are you going to be there helping them? No, they make, listen. Businesses make their own decisions, and uh, employees make their own decisions. Whatever they want to do. I'm the governor well, of everybody in the Commonwealth of Virginia. You're, you're, you wouldn't support employees trying to unionize in Northern. I let everybody make their own decisions. They got to do their own organizing. Of course, I'm governor. I'm the governor of everybody. All right. I love everybody. I'm a, I'm a lover. Let, let me, uh, Virginia is for lovers. Let me move to a climate change question. This is a one minute. We're a little low on time, so one minute to each of you on this. Uh, Mr. Young, Virginians underpay for flood insurance, but overpaying also could reduce home prices. Dealing with climate change, the state, country, entire world are dealing with this. Yeah. Who should be paying more when it comes to these issues of flood insurance? Should it be the government? Should it be wealthier taxpayers? Is it someone else? How do we pay for this adaptation and mitigation? Well, to you first. the first thing, first thing we need to recognize is that we do have a challenge. We have a challenge. I'm from, I'm from Hampton Roads. And the challenges that Hampton Roads are facing right now with rising sea levels and, and stormwater drain issues are serious. And so we have to go to work now in order to address those. We have to go to work in order to make sure that there's funding available so that they can prepare for rising seas. The challenge that we've got, however, is that the plan that's been put forth with the Virginia Clean Economy Act is unworkable. I've spoken to the heads of the utilities. They don't even know how to do it, dismantling all of our clean, burning natural gas. We're going to turn Virginia into California and get ready. Brownouts and blackouts are coming. And the reason why Ford doesn't want to come here is one of them is they don't trust our power supply. We, in fact, need to have a different plan. We need to embrace all aspects of power generation, wind, solar, nuclear, and our clean, burning natural gas. My opponent wants to accelerate this transition by 10 years, okay. and it will absolutely destabilize Virginia. It will cost Virginia taxpayers even more right. than $800 is expected now. Mr. McCall, one to you. I want to see it done by 2035. When I think of clean energy, I think of jobs. Glenn Youngkin said he just announced again, he's not for the clean plan of the past. It's the only way we're going to make progress here in the Commonwealth of Virginia. When we finally rejoined the Paris Agreement to join the rest of the world to show that we're serious about it, he said it was totally frustrating that America got back in it. So he doesn't want to do anything on clean energy. I will be the clean energy governor. I've always said this. Let's do it by 2035. The opportunities we have. Yeah, Hampton Roads, they've seen their sea level rise by 14 inches since 1950. I worked hard. The Ohio Creek project that I did with the HUD, $135 million to save an African American neighborhood to build the new seawalls. We've got to do that all over Hampton Roads. But what I think about, we have these two new wind turbines that are 27 miles off the coast of Virginia Beach. We're going to have 200 more in three years. I want to see all those turbines, blades. I want that manufactured here. I think the Portsmouth Marine Terminal, I truly believe, can be the green energy manufacturing hub for the United States of America. That is America's future. Right, and Virginia is going to lead the way, and that's going to be hundreds of thousands of jobs. A couple quick questions for both of you, 30 yeah, seconds yeah. each. Mr. Youngkin, should members of Virginia's Republican congressional delegation on Thursday vote for the bipartisan infrastructure bill? Do you want Virginia's yeah. Republican members of Congress to vote for that bill that will provide money to Virginia? Yeah, I believe that there is, a, there is good future in the infrastructure bill. And I look forward to those funds coming to Virginia and putting them to work. And one of the realities is when you have an offshore wind project that I wholly support, but you have people who have never run a business, never negotiated something before negotiating, all of the supply chain is not in America, not in Virginia. We should have negotiated American content, Virginian content in that. And that's what you get when you let people to office who don't know how to run a business. They end up giving up opportunities and then coming back and trying to make it up after they've missed the vote. All right, before you jump in, Mr. McCall, yeah. should do you support the $3.5 trillion package that Democrats are working on in Congress? Or do you think that number should come down a little bit? Uh, let, me, let me ask you, it's so frightening to listen to him talk about Virginia content. We don't make it yet.
Mr. McCullough, you toyed with the idea of running for president in 2020. Do you pledge to serve your entire term as governor if you win this race? Yes, absolutely. And Listen, I look at that didn't go too far, so. Okay. <laughs> uh, and Mr. Johnson, if Donald Trump runs for president in 2024, will you support him? Yeah, who knows who's going to run for president in 2024? Well, and maybe Sanders, who knows? Let me just start. If he's a Republican, if he's a Republican nominee, I'll support him. I want to just be clear. When Terry McCullough stepped in in 2014, he adopted the exact same tactics that the Democrats in Washington are using right now and tried to shut down Virginia's government. He threatened to shut it down. He forgets this because it's not pleasant for him to remember. And then in 2017, the rating agencies came and were getting ready to downtick Virginia because of his, his inability to manage fiscal responsibility. This is what you get with Terry McCullough. All right, I do need to answer that. So, so just so the facts are clear. The reason I say we're downgrade is because the debt that I inherited from the prior administration. And I flew to New York with Republicans, with me, and guess what? We negotiated it. I mean, Glenn, you just got to get your facts right, buddy. I mean, we went out, you can call the senators, the Republican senators who went to New York when they, it was because we had a $2.5 billion hole in our budget. You get to continue this debate after we're done here. But the good news is this. You each get your one-minute closing statements, and Mr. Youngkin, I believe you go first in this one. Go ahead. Thank you. I'd first like to thank my wife, Suzanne, and our four children. You are amazing. My fellow Virginians, tonight I invite you to join me. Join me in breaking free from what has plagued our country in divided neighborhoods for too long. Broken politics, failed promises, failed leadership. You deserve better. My campaign was founded on a vision that would confront challenges, not people, that would deliver results, not excuses. It's time to summon the spirit of Washington, of Jefferson, of Madison, and yes, Mason, by coming together to build a Virginia that we can all be proud of, a Virginia that leads. Together, we will build schools that launch our students to new heights. Together, we will build communities by reclaiming our neighborhoods from crime. Together, we will build jobs and a rip-roaring economy that will lift up all Virginians. Okay. So join me tonight with a new vision for leadership, and let's build that Virginia together. Mr. McCulloch, you're one minute. Let me thank all of you. I am so excited to be with you tonight. But you just heard Glenn Youngkin introduce himself to Northern Virginia voters, and it was all an act. He wants to ban abortions, let's be clear. He's against gay marriage, let's be clear. He says the single most important issue facing Virginia today is election integrity. I don't think that's the case. I will work in a bipartisan way as I did before. That is why in 2017, Governing Magazine made me the public official of the year for the United States of America. I was proud of that. He said so much of the reason that he's running for governor, his quote, is because of Donald Trump. Well, I want every Virginia watching tonight. I'm running for governor for you. And if you elect me as your governor, I promise you this. I will raise the minimum wage to 15 bucks. I'll get paid sick days, family medical leave. I will put money into our education system so our children learn the skills they need. And I'm going to make sure that all 700,000 Virginians get quality health care. I'm excited. Right. Working together, the state's going to take off like a booster rocket. Thank you, guys. Let's go. Well, thank Make you, sure you Thank you to the Northern Virginia Chamber, the Shar School, NBC4, Tom Mundo 44 for hosting this debate. Thank you. Karen McCullough and Glenn Youngkin for your participation. This is what democracy can look like in a positive way. Thanks to our great panel of Julie Gordo and the Northern Virginia Community College Alexandria Campus. Thank you for the use of this theater. Stay with News 4, NBCWashington.com for continuing coverage of this election. And by the way, don't forget to vote. Thank you. Talk to you. Anyways, that is the debate. Um, yeah, I went silent towards the end. I was reading something, but ultimately, um, I would definitely say that Glenn Youngkin destroyed him. I'd say he'd beat him by a very healthy margin. I'd say he. I think Glenn Youngkin performed at an 8 out of 10, whereas I think uh, Terry McAuliffe did anything but short of actually having a complete public meltdown. I think he looked bad. I think he came off wrong. I think his energy was all fucked up, and I think his cadence and delivery of everything was wrong, and he didn't get any good hits at um, Glenn Youngkin that are going to stick. So I, I would rate him a 3 out of 10. So an 8 uh, out of 10 performance from the Republican, the Democrat performed at a 3. I think that... Um, if Glenn Youngkin's, I, I mean, I guess if I were going to guess, um, last week, if his odds were 20% chance of winning, I think I've just increased it to 35% chance of winning. I think this debate substantially increased his odds. I think he did really well. And I think McAuliffe shit the bed here. So because of that, I think his, he's going to do about 2% better just off of this debate alone because yeah, for obvious reasons. I mean, this appeals to nobody, even the moderates say like, okay, this Democrat's being a bitch right now. And him mentioning Trump so many times, I mean, who does that, who does that appeal to that already isn't going to vote, uh, I mean, for Youngkin? So, I mean, this is very obviously a bad tactic, and it's very clear that uh, Youngkin coin is going up, and McAuliffe is looking like a big weenie right now. So, because of that, I will declare Glenn Youngkin the undisputed champion of the two debates, especially this one. He improved over the last one. His delivery is good, and not blowing his composure is extremely important, and he just did that um, holding his own. So, anyways, thank you guys for watching, and comment down below who do you think won the debate, and anything you want to, you know, comment down below. I'll go ahead and uh, read and respond to probably. Anyways, bye.